black diamond shoes, harness and belay gloves, cams, uh, extra locking carabiners, uh, 60 meters of synthetic rope, bag and chalk, vented helmet. A good number of you, maybe most of you, uh, know perhaps what this partial list of items and equipment are intended to be used for. I'm confident some of you know for sure. Uh, rock climbing, rock climbing. Uh, if you're like me, you're not a climber. Uh, you've climbed very few times on some small uh, rock faces. But I'm confident that many of us, uh, even with little to no experience, with the use of some of these items, could manage to scale uh, 15, 20, 30 foot boulders or rock faces. But if you're going to attempt El Capitan, El Capitan, Capitan, in Yosemite National Park, uh, a 3,000 foot vertical rock face with some of the hardest and uh, most challenging technical places for climbing, you're going to need a whole lot more than the right equipment. What are you going to need? You're going to need instruction. You're going to need a lot of training, probably mentorship, a community, added ongoing experience. In some ways, the Christian life is a bit like this. The Lord gives his people everything that they need for life and godliness. The equipment, the means of grace, the people. But his provision, while it begins with instruction and it continues with instruction, that instruction, that teaching is to become a part of the whole of our life. So that a person is moving from learning about climbing to becoming a climber. Moving from learning about discipleship to seeing oneself more and more in their identity as a follower of Jesus Christ. And so, as we continue in our brief series of four weeks, preparing for and moving toward the Gospel of Mark, which I'm very much looking forward to, we're focusing on really four pillars that make up the larger mission of the, of the Church of Jesus Christ. Worship, education, instruction, teaching, fellowship, and missions, outreach, evangelism. So we're into this component of education and learning in the mission of the Church of, of uh, Jesus Christ. I have chosen the text of Titus 2, so I encourage you to turn there comes right after 1st and 2nd Timothy, and then you've got uh, the letter uh, of Titus here. Titus 2. And I'll read the whole of that chapter. Listen now to God's word, Titus 2, verse 1. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They're to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, Urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They're to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. 
Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. What we're told in the opening verses of this fairly short three-chapter letter that it's the Apostle Paul in the opening verse of chapter 1. This is Paul, and he is writing in verse 4 mentioned uh, to Titus. Paul, the Apostle, writing to Titus, and he calls him uh, my true child in a common faith. And then Paul mentions in verse 5 of chapter 1 that he had left Titus in Crete, uh, Greek island and the Aegean Sea, larger Mediterranean. Maybe uh, some of you have been there. I have not. If you have, I'd love to hear about it. But uh, pictures of Crete, um, they're just beautiful uh, places there, ports and beaches and water. While there's only uh, mention of Paul's visit to Crete briefly on his journey to Rome toward the end of uh, the book of Acts, We have no description in all of Acts or in any of Paul's letters of any missionary work that Paul had done there. However, church history has understood that after Paul's first imprisonment recorded in the last chapter of Acts, Acts 28, a two-year house arrest that he was under, there where he wrote Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon, the so-called prison epistles. After that, he was released around 62 AD and continued ministering for a couple of years. Perhaps he traveled to Spain, to Crete, other places. During that portion of his ministry is the time we understand that he wrote 1 Timothy and Titus, was then imprisoned a second time in Rome under the Roman emperor Nero, mid late 60s. And it, during that time, he wrote 2 Timothy, the last words that we have recorded from, uh, from Paul, where he would be executed uh, or martyred. Of the dozen or so times that Titus, the name Titus is mentioned in the New Testament, you have eight in 2 Corinthians, two in Galatians, and one each in 2 Timothy and Titus. We learn from those verses that not only did Titus accompany Paul on some of his mis- missionary journeys, ministry endeavors, But like Timothy, uh, this is someone Paul clearly poured himself into. And this is someone he trusts very much. Why does Paul leave or station Titus in Crete? Why is he writing to him? Well, we see in verse 5 of chapter 1. This is why I left you in Crete, that you might put what remained into order... Appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Well, those words indicate that there were, it seems, multiple churches that had been planted. Maybe mission kinds of churches. They're being formed uh, in and around Crete. He begins in chapter 1 by stressing the importance of leadership. So, like we heard earlier, the qualifications for elders in 1 Timothy 3. Here we hear it. Again, in 1 Timothy 1, you've got a set of qualifications given uh, for leadership, for elders. So he begins there, but he pretty quickly shifts to the subject of our text, which is instruction in truth, in the truth, instruction in sound doctrine. Not only were there uh, deceivers, false teachers that Titus would have to navigate and, and the churches there, But in chapter 1, verse 12, if you look there, Paul quotes a a Cretan prophet, one of their own prophets, that, quote, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. So there's that to deal with as well. So you've got false teaching, but you also have a culture that's less than ideal uh, in terms of virtue and character and morality. What's Paul's remedy? instruction, instruction in sound doctrine. And we should be reminded, teaching and instruction is a hallmark of our faith, of Christianity. Ours is a faith that centers on a book, on words, on understanding, the place of the mind. I want to highlight some points about doctrine. First of all, doctrine or teaching exists not for the end, 
that people might come to merely give assent to these things. Assent, agreement with truth. Rather, doctrine, truth exists to be spiritually formed. To form people spiritually. So that a life would be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. The man, the God-man. He's the exact imprint of the nature of God. He is the Lord. And we read in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, the very purpose for our existence. God's aim for humanity. 829, for those whom God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. We are predestined as Christians to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Uh, that, that's to be at the core of our, uh, our life existence and purpose. To have the humility uh, of the Lord Jesus. To have the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. To have the devotion that Christ had for his Father, for the Word. Notice the focus on teaching in our passage. Verse 1 of chapter 2. But as for you, Titus, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Verse 3, regarding older women. They are to teach what is good. Back to Titus, Paul says to him in verse 7 and 8. In your teaching, show integrity, dignity, sound speech that cannot be condemned. It seems to me that... Uh, there are at least two uh, false and equally dangerous views of the Christian faith when it comes to doctrine or teachings. One is that doctrine doesn't really matter. Instruction or teaching or truths, doctrine, it doesn't really matter. All that really matters is a well-intentioned person, a well-intentioned heart. Huge danger. Two is the danger of thinking that all that matters is getting your doctrine right. As long as we've got our doctrine correct, we're fine. And potentially failing to appropriate the doctrine into the fabric of life. That's dead orthodoxy. One of my uh, professors, John Frame, uh, would say theology is application. Perhaps you've heard that phrase. That's helpful. Theology, truth, exists for the fabric of life. Yes, the mind, but all of of life, as we'll see as we continue. The repeated word sound through the text, I think, is helpful. Verse 1, sound doctrine. In 2, sound in faith. In 8, sound uh, speech. This is the word uh, hygia nuse, and it simply means wellness, health. This is where we get the idea and word hygiene. We can all imagine how uh, grimy, filthy, unwell life would be if we hardly ever washed our clothes, if we rarely ever brushed our teeth, or scarcely bathed or showered. Truth, doctrine, can become unwell. It can be sick or ill. And then ill doctrine, of course, can infect a people. The question is, what's, what is doctrine for? What is truth for? It's to shape the whole of one's life and the whole of a community's life. This is part of the reason I chose this particular text. It does so well in communicating the relationship of doctrine to life. Paul begins by exhorting Titus to teach what accords with sound doctrine. Yet what is the doctrine focused on and aimed at but the transformation and the sanctification of all of life? Older men are to be dignified, disciplined, steadfast. Older women, reverent, controlled in speech. Younger women, loving their husbands, pure, hardworking. Younger men, self-controlled. This is all truth reaching into the fabric, the warp and wolf of life. And he says to Titus in verse 7, show yourself a model of good works. Let me offer a couple of things about truth or doctrine having a formational effect upon a believer. First of all, truth or doctrine will not have 
its God-intended effect if it is only a matter of the intellect. God is after our intellect. He is after our minds and what we think and how we think. But it is not to remain merely an intellectual uh, matter. Listen to John Calvin here. He says, Doctrine is not an affair of the tongue, but of the life. It's not apprehended by the intellect and and memory alone. Like other branches of learning, it is received only when it possesses the whole soul and finds its seat and habitation in the inmost recesses of the heart. I think the parable of the sower is helpful here. The parable that Jesus gives in Matthew 13. As the seed in the picture, the truth or gospel is sown, it lands in various places, various soils, various minds and hearts and lives. But it's the relationship between the seed and the soil that makes the difference. Right? For the seed to have effect and bear fruit, it must take some kind of root. It's insufficient to merely grasp intellectually the seed. The seed must enter in and begin affecting or having relationship with the soil, establishing roots, occupying the space of that soil. It is to affect our minds, our intellect, but it must go beyond to the desires and then beyond to uh, the way in which we live. And this is what Jonathan Edwards called the affections, with an A. Not meaning mere emotions, but what he called, quote, the more vigorous inclinations and will of the soul. Inclination of uh, desires. So the gospel and truth of God's word is having such an effect that it is not only changing what we know, what we understand. Man's great problem is not merely that he's ignorant of the truth. That could be a problem. But it's also what he is desiring. He must not only know what is true but be inclined and desire what is truth and conform his life after the truth. Remember the church in in Ephesus where Paul had left Timothy. We read in Revelation chapter 2, the Lord commends the Ephesians uh, for a number of things. Their diligent service of Christ, for their toil, their patient endurance, their soundness in doctrine. But then the Lord is willing to say, I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember from where you've fallen, repent and return to your first love. One of my favorite uh, verses in all of Scripture is Ephesians 4.23. The verse just prior, Ephesians 4.22, and right after, verse 24, say essentially the same thing. Put off the old self and put on the new self. Both of which, in the Greek, communicate these are actions that we are called to engage in and carry out in an ongoing way. Putting off and putting on. But then sandwiched between those are these words. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Be renewed in the spirit of of your mind. Well, spirit there, uh, lowercase s, is not the human spirit. This is the only place in all of Scripture where we read the phrase, the spirit of your mind. It's not the human spirit. It's not the Holy Spirit. It's the spirit of your mind. This is what Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones called really the governing principle of your mind. That which, in a sense, rules the mind. We could have all the right information, but what's governing me, what's governing my mind, is going to make all the difference. The fundamental problem of the pagan's mind is not that he fails to have the right information. That could be. Yes, he needs to hear the truth. More fundamentally, he needs what governs him and his thinking to be made new. To be made new. And what a glorious 
truth this is in Scripture. Uh, by the way, that passage, Ephesians 4, 23, is not like 22 and 24. It's passive. You're actually not, this is not something you do. This is God working constantly to renew us, the spirit of our minds. We have a God who is constantly working and serving to make us new again. It's a wonderful reality. Not just our intellect, but our desire. Another aspect about doctrine is that it's to have its way in every facet of life. And, and I think Paul stresses this. Our, our character is emphasized, reverent in behavior, dignity, and integrity. In verse 3 and 7, relationships in the church and in the home. Verse 3 and 4, our faith, devotion, and sanctification. Verse 12. And so in this way, the Christian life or faith is like a house with many rooms. We don't just live in the kitchen. I, I would like to live in the kitchen, actually, but we don't just live in the dining room or just in the bedroom. Likewise, our faith is not to remain in the room of the intellect alone or in the room of public worship, as important as these are, but into every facet, relationships, character formation, the life of the mind, our vocation, the shaping of our life purpose and identity, how we spend our money, how we raise our children, everything. And so in this way, the Christian life teaches a grand vision for all of life. So doctrine exists to spiritually form a people. The second thing I would mention is that uh, doctrine is a covenant community endeavor. You could say covenant community commitment, three C's. Uh, Paul so wonderfully exhorts and describes the kind of cooperation and collaboration that is to, to occur in the discipling and teaching ministry of the church, just in this text alone. Notice, teaching and instruction is not merely elder to congregation. Not that, not, not that framework alone. After he directs Titus in chapter 1, what does he say? Appoint elders, overseers. They are to ensure that ministry, including teaching and preaching, be carried out. But he then goes further to highlight particular groups within the church and their calling in the discipling of one another. Particularly is an emphasis upon women, older women, in verse uh, 3 and 4. He says older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children to be self-controlled. Then we have Paul's words in Romans 15, 14. Paul says, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, note brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and here it is, able to instruct one another. This is Paul to the church in Rome, writing to everyone, that you're able to instruct one another. It's the word sometimes translated into counsel. The, the whole church is called into these aspects in which you may be the only person who can provide the kind of counsel in, in a situation. You're called to do that or provide sound instruction. Years ago, I was listening to a, a sermon by a pastor. He was a guest preacher at this particular uh, church or event. The room was filled with thousands of, of people. He was preaching on the text of Hebrews uh, 5, verse 12. Here, here's 5, 12, familiar to many of us. The author says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, writing to all of them, you need someone to teach you again. Uh, the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. At one point in his preaching, he reached down beside his uh, pulpit or stand, and he had a, a paper bag, and he pulled out of that paper bag a bottle, a baby bottle. 
He's saying nothing, and he just begins to drink. This is not something I would, I would do, but I'm, I'm willing to tell you about it. <laughs> this is what he did. And he begins to drink from it. He's sucking from this baby bottle. And then he pauses, he looks up and says, does this look odd to you? And he says, it should. Well, why is, that, why is this odd? Well, it looks strange, not because it's a baby bottle, but because the, the bottle is in an adult's mouth, in this case, a preacher's. He's doing what an infant might do. He's not moved along. He's not grown up. And part of his point was he's receiving from others, learning from others, consuming from others, but he's only on the receiving end, and it's not sinking in very deeply. The picture of of Titus 2 is not a picture of uh, individuals who, who happen to participate in the same church and learn from one or two teachers. No, the picture is that of a colony of people whose lives are bound and knit together in such a way that younger women are learning from older women, younger men from older men, where instruction is not only cerebral and academic, though scripture is full of deep truth, but where instruction is in the form of of discipling, where apprenticeship is happening. And I think there is much fruit of that in the life of our church where people are learning, ah, this is what it means to be a godly mother. This is what it looks like to bear witness and be a godly person of integrity and trustworthiness in my workplace. This is what it looks like to come alongside another member, counsel them, guide them, love them with truth and grace. And and really our text is a reflection of what God has done with his own people coming into their world, coming alongside, moving in close to redeem, to shower grace upon them, and then grow them in grace and truth. So it's, it's a covenant community endeavor as, as the household of faith. Finally, doctrine worked out in and through us is to be a witness of God's wonderful grace. That doctrine, that truth, worked in and through the church of Christ is to be a witness. Verse 11 of our text. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation, training us to renounce ungodliness, to live godly lives in this present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness teach in accordance with sound doctrine Uh, teach what is good train one another paul is saying why for the grace of god has appeared man's most fundamental problem for many people in the world a problem they may be ignorant of they may hardly understand a separation from god himself at enmity enmity with god there's a hatred A coming destruction. Yet one that can be met with a remedy through Jesus Christ. The pardon and forgiveness of sin. A bridge to be brought into fellowship with God. The crucifixion of the Lord Jesus. He has appeared bringing salvation. This appearing salvation would not only provide a pardon but a transformation of radical change it would be a new life one shaped by godliness one uh, infused with tremendous hope i think about the kind of change that happens when a married couple brings into their home their first child i and we've been blessed to 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 see that happen in the life of our church on a number of uh, occasions. It's a kind of invasion. I'm going to use the word invasion. It's a glorious invasion. It's good. But so much changes. Sleep patterns. Schedules. Priorities change. Life shifts. Last Sunday after worship... 
someone said, oh, all three of your children, are, they're on the mission trip. That means you and Shelly, you have the whole week to yourselves. I said, yep, we've got the whole week. I'm not, not sure how we're going to, not sure how to function without our kids. Well, it was a good week. I had a good week. I mean, I'm glad our kids are back. <laughs> but for the last 18 years, we've been used to and blessed by orienting life with children in it. And that's a blessing. How much more should the believer's life be changed, oriented, shaped, and altered with the Son of God on the throne of their life and heart? How much more should the world see that something other than my will or my wishes or my interests is giving shape to my life? I've never met new parents who thought it, it wasn't a big deal, the entrance of their child into the world and into their lives. It's a huge deal. Like marriage. This is, it's a new life. It's a new step. And you're happy to let that new brightness in your life shine forth. The grace of God has appeared. The way, the truth, the life. So Jesus says, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds, your faith, your life in Christ and that they may turn and praise our Heavenly Father. Let's look to our God in prayer. Father, thank you for your church, for calling us to yourself, uniting us, making us one, and Lord, for uh, the truth of the gospel and the truth of your word uh, to work its way in and through our lives, um, individually as families and marriages and children, and the whole of this community, uh, we thank you for who you are as a God of truth, a God who knows us uh, completely, accepts us and embrace, embraces us fully, uh, and who desires and is at work. Uh, renewing us, um, making us more in the image of, of his son. We thank you for your, uh, your Holy Spirit who indwells us and continues to be at work within us. Uh, grow us, fill us with hope and joy, uh, Lord, that we might continue to be a, a learning community uh, centered around your word. For this we pray with thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.